hello, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. I'm Renee Carpenter, State Social Work Director for the Alabama Department of Public Health, and I want to thank you for joining us today for our program, The Evolution of Social Work Ethics. Continuing education credit has been approved for social workers only for today's program, and it does meet the State Board of Social Work Examiner's requirements for ethics training. Because this program is being offered on demand only, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet, evaluation, and social work quiz. All three documents must be sent to the address on the bottom of the sign-in sheet in order to receive your continuing education certificate. If you work for an agency other than the Alabama Department of Public Health and would prefer to receive your continuing education certificates by email, please include your email address along with your mailing address on the sign-in form. While content may continue to be relevant, continuing education credit will only be awarded for two years, expiring on July 31, 2018. And now let's get started with our program. The Evolution of Social Work Ethics. Our objectives today are to understand the history of social work ethics, to understand why ethical standards have changed over time, and to understand the ramifications of violating our code of ethics. We'll also touch on some ethical dilemmas at the end of our program. So to begin with, let's talk about what is a profession. A profession is a disciplined group of individuals who adhere to ethical standards. This group positions itself as possessing special knowledge and skills, in a widely recognized body of learning derived from research, education, and training at a high level, and it is recognized by the public as such. A profession is also prepared to apply this knowledge and exercise these skills in the interest of others. So looking at this definition, social work is a profession. But sometimes we hear people refer to themselves as an expert, but not necessarily a professional. So what is the difference between an expert and a professional? Well, a professional is a member of a profession, sounds simple enough, and professionals are governed by codes of ethics, and that's what we're talking about today. Professionals also profess commitment to competence, integrity, and morality, altruism, and the promotion of the public good within their expert domain. Professionals are accountable to those served and to society, and it's that accountability that we'll be discussing. The history of social work ethics goes back um, over 50 years. The National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics was established on October 13, 1960, which is about 62 years after the what is generally accepted as the date that the profession began, which was around 1898. Now, in 1960, our Code of Ethics was a one-page document, and it had 14 major points. So in 1960, those 14 points were improving social conditions, that the professional responsibility is primary instead of our personal interests, personal responsibility for the quality of services, respect for privacy, use information gained in a responsible manner, to respect the views and actions of our colleagues, to practice within the knowledge and competence of the profession, professional responsibility to add to the body of knowledge, and to protect the community against unethical practice, Number 10, to give professional service in public emergencies, to, dis to distinguish clearly between statements and actions made as an individual and as a representative of an organization. 12, to, to support professional education, to create conditions within agencies that allow social workers to adhere to this code, and lastly, to contribute knowledge, skills, and support to programs of human welfare. Now that was in 1960. The code was amended in 1967, and if you think about what all was going on in our country at that time, then you clearly understand why the 15th component was added. And that is that services would be provided without discrimination on the basis of race, color, 
religion, age, sex, or national ancestry. Now, a couple of items are missing from that list, and they were later added, and those are that there would be no discrimination based on disability or sexual orientation. In 1999, the NASW revised the Code of Ethics. Today, the NASW Code of Ethics is a 27-page document that's broken down into six major components. Now, does that mean that we are less ethical now than we were back in 1960 when it was only a one-page document? Of course not. What's happened is that over time, practices have changed. Technology has especially changed. Back in 1960, when a social worker wanted to communicate with a client, there were basically three ways to do that. That was face-to-face, -face, on the telephone, or through a letter. Today, we have uh, text messages, emails. We can Skype, FaceTime. There's social media. All of these things that in 1960 were really science fiction are now part of the way that we generally conduct business. Therefore, that we had to clarify our code of ethics because there's a lot more ways that we can actually violate that code of ethics now than back in 1960. But those six major components are service, social justice, dignity and worth of the person, the importance of human relationships, integrity, and competence. Now, the laws that govern social workers in Alabama specifically are found in the Code of Alabama, 1975, Title 34, Chapter 30. And this is the chapter that's related to all professionals. So there's a link on the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners website, which is www.socialwork.alabama.gov. So the components of the ABSW Code of Ethics really mirror that of the NASW, as you might imagine. And those are the social worker's conduct, the social worker's ethical responsibility to clients, social worker's ethical responsibility to colleagues, social worker's ethical responsibility to their employer, the social worker's ethical responsibility to the profession, and the social worker's ethical responsibility to society. So we're going to look at these, uh, each component, and what I've done is list three of the most obvious examples of how this um, could possibly be violated, each one of these components. So component number one, the social worker's conduct. The social worker shall not condone or participate in dishonesty, fraud, deceit, misrepresentation, or criminal activity. Now, that seems pretty straightforward. Uh, we don't want to steal from our, our clients, uh, from our clients' families. We certainly don't want to document that services were provided that actually were not. Uh, that would be fraud and dishonesty as well as criminal activity. Another um, component that falls under number one is the social worker shall not exploit professional relationships for personal gain. This is somewhat of a gray area. And by that, I'll give you an example. Um, if a social worker is looking for a housekeeper and that their client perhaps is looking for a housekeeping job, then should the social worker hire the client to be their housekeeper? Um, that, would, that could possibly be interpreted as um, exploiting professional relationships for personal gain. It's sort of a slippery slope. Another example is that the social worker shall not allow personal problems, substance abuse, or mental health difficulties to interfere with professional judgment. Again, this is a very difficult situation. Uh, we all know clearly that use of alcohol or other drugs on the job is something we should not be a part of. But what about our own personal issues with maybe depression? What about early onset of Alzheimer's? There are certain times when um, our own mental health difficulties may interfere with our professional judgment. Moving on to component number two, our responsibility to our clients. The social worker shall maintain confidentiality of clients' information. 
Now, we've known that since the very beginning, of course. However, you have to remember that back in 1960, all records were paper records. Uh, today, we have um, electronic records are very, very common. So we have to worry about cybersecurity. It's no longer as simple as locking the door of the office. Uh, there are a lot of other ways that confidentiality could be breached. And uh, we also have to be concerned about social media, uh, being very, very mindful of things that we may post on Facebook or Instagram or any of, of the uh, social media websites that might possibly link us to a particular client and then release something personal about that client. So that's another slippery slope, if you will. B, the social worker shall not practice or condone any form of discrimination. Now, when we think of discrimination, a lot of times, or uh, probably most of the time, what we think about is situations that are very overt, very intentional. But we also need to make a habit of being aware of unintentional discrimination. And the, the most common example I can give of that would be um, actually discriminating against someone that, with a disability when we don't intend to. Oftentimes we think that for those who are hearing impaired, for example, that the closed captioning that scrolls across the bottom of their, our screen is sufficient. But perhaps someone is not a very good reader. Maybe they don't speak English, but they understand American Sign Language. So it's times like that that we really have to pay close attention to the different groups that we might accidentally exclude uh, when we're providing services. Another example is that the social worker shall not engage in any form of sexual relationship with clients, whether by force or consensual, nor with former clients, nor with the family members of clients. And unfortunately, this has resulted in a lot of disciplinary action through our board. So this is one to always be very, very mindful of. Component three, our responsibility to colleagues. And by colleagues, we're not just talking about our social work colleagues. We're also talking about um, colleagues in other disciplines. Um, within the health department, we have a multitude of disciplines. Other agencies also have other disciplines. So when you, you see that responsibility to colleagues, I want you to think beyond just social work. A, the social worker shall treat colleagues with fairness, respect, and courtesy. B, the social worker who is a supervisor shall act with fairness, consideration, and in an equitable manner. I've been a supervisor for many, many years, and I know that it's very, very easy to unintentionally overload a worker who is one who always gets the job done and never complains. And that's something that as supervisors we have to be very mindful of as well. C, a social worker who believes a colleague to be incompetent, and if that colleague hasn't taken steps to address the incompetence, must act through proper channels. Now, proper channels would mean going through the chain of command, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later. So component four, our responsibility to the employer. Social workers should adhere to commitments made to their employer. In other words, do what you say you're going to do. Do the job that you were hired to do. The social workers should use the resources of their employer for the purposes in which they were intended. Uh, that could be as simple as using a copier to make copies of your church bulletin, for example. Um, that's something that we should avoid doing at all costs. And C, social workers should strive to improve the effectiveness of the services of their employer. Again, going back to the example about the hearing impaired person who perhaps can't read the closed captioning, we should strive to make sure that the services we provide or that our agency provides are the most effective possible. Component five our responsibility to the profession. The social worker should take action through appropriate channels 
against unethical conduct by any member of the profession. Now, I'm not one that usually likes to quote uh, fictional characters. However, if you are a fan of J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, then you're familiar with the character of Dumbledore. And one of the things that Dumbledore is quoted as saying is that it takes a great deal of courage to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. Reporting a coworker or another social worker for unethical conduct is an extremely difficult thing to do. Now, within our agency, the Department of Public Health, the responsibility for that falls on the Office of the, or the Division of Social Work, which is the office that I'm responsible for. And the State Social Work Director is the one who does file those complaints with the board. And usually those come to my awareness through disciplinary action. Letter B, the social worker should strive to become and remain proficient in professional practice. Just like you wouldn't expect your physician to be using the same medications, perhaps, that were used 30 or 40 years ago, we as social workers should strive to become more proficient and to learn new techniques as well. So that's why um, CEU programs are so important. And it's also very important to stay up to date on changing environments. Um, in 1960, HIV didn't exist. So it, things change, and we as social workers have to stay on top of that. C, the social worker should make no misrepresentation as to competence, qualifications, service, etc. In other words, don't say that you're trained in something that you really are not trained in. That's falsification that will get you in a lot of trouble with our board. Component six, responsibility to society. Social workers should act to ensure that all persons have access to needed services and resources. Social workers should advocate for conditions that respect the diversity of cultures. An example of that would be for, um, think about posters perhaps that are in your lobby. Do the people in the posters represent the people in the community? And C, the social worker should provide appropriate services during public emergencies. Now, if you're an employee of public health, then one of your R's and R's is about responding to disasters. That is not an option. It's not a choice. It's something that you are required to do. And if you are called to duty and do not respond, then that's insubordination, and there will be um, some disciplinary action taken. So speaking of disciplinary action, what steps are taken when a, a complaint is filed with the board? Well, in addition to action that may be taken by your employer, there are also steps in the dis disciplinary process of the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners. And these really mirror the, um, the, the court system. I think you'll find this very familiar. One, um, a formal complaint is made in writing to the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners using the complaint form that's found on the agency's website. Anonymous complaints are not taken. So the complaint has to be signed by the person who is filing that complaint. And I know that there have been several social workers who have actually not filed complaints because they didn't want to sign their name to that. Uh, if you're familiar with the laws at DHR, or the, the protocols at DHR, that anonymous complaints are taken on abuse and neglect. Well, those are not taken by the board against unethical conduct of social workers. Next, the board's investigative committee will review the information and determine whether there is probable cause. So they will look at the information. They may interview other people. They may go out into the field and interview possible witnesses just to determine if there's enough evidence to actually bring this to a hearing. The third step is that the licensee will receive a certified copy of the complaint and will be given a chance to respond to the allegations. 
the social worker shall be given 30 days to respond, either admitting or denying the allegations. Number five is something I really want to stress because failure to respond within this time frame without good cause constitutes an admission of the allegations. This is something you have to take very seriously. Now a complaint can be filed to the board against someone for any reason. It's sort of like filing a, a lawsuit today. Um, anyone can sue anybody for anything. It doesn't mean that they're going to win the case. This, the same is true with filing a complaint with the Board of Social Work Examiners. Again, whether or not the allegations are true, you must respond to those allegations. Otherwise, it's like an admission of guilt. So what happens in a disciplinary hearing? Well, first of all, disciplinary hearings are open to the public. So that means anyone can attend these and listen to the things that you're being accused of. Secondly, the social worker may be represented by counsel at the expense of the social worker. In other words, you can have an attorney present, but you will be responsible for paying those attorney fees. Third, at the hearing, the social worker will enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. Then there will be opening statements, just like in any court case. There will be a presentation of the evidence, um, not only the allegations that were made, but also the evidence that was collected during the investigation by the board. And then there will be closing arguments from both sides. So how are these cases settled? Well, there's a, there's, it's possible to have an informal disposition that's sort of like settling out of court. Uh, these dispositions are made prior to the case being heard. So the stipulations of the settlement are put into writing, they're signed by all parties involved, and then they're made public record. If it goes to a hearing, then the hearing officer's decision is the other way that a settlement can be made. The hearing officer will also make a recommendation. So following the hearing, the hearing officer makes a written decision and submits it along with the recommendations to the executive director of the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners. Now within 45 days of receiving the hearing officer's recommendations, the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners will meet and will issue a final order. So the board has the option of affirming all or only part of what the hearing officer recommended they may reject it, or they may modify what the hearing officer's recommendations were. The social worker or other interested party will receive notification by first class mail. Now notice that the, the final order is received by first class mail, not certified mail. Only the uh, complaint and the allegations are sent by certified mail. Um, all attorneys of record are also given a final order. So what can happen in situations where the, the social worker is actually found guilty of an ethical violation? Well, the most severe punishment that the board has is to revoke a social worker's license. When a social worker loses their license, then they also lose their ability to work in the profession until the license has been reinstated. Now the minimum length of time that a license is revoked is two years. And it's up to the board as to when, if, or under what stipulations a revoked license may be reinstated. Now if you are an employee of the Department of Public Health, then it is a requirement of your, of your position to have a license. If that's the case, and in most of the cases it is, then if your license is revoked by the board, then you will also be terminated by human resources. It's not an option. Secondly, and, and slightly less severe, is to have uh, your license suspended. Now the social worker whose license has been suspended may not practice until the suspension has been lifted. So examples of stipulations to lift a suspension 
are additional continuing education in ethics. And when I've seen this uh, stipulation required, most of the time that the requirement is for anywhere from 3 to 15 additional hours of ethics training. The board may also require additional supervision. And again, what I have seen most often is anywhere from three months to six months of additional supervision. And or the licensee may be required to pay an administrative fine. And the fines that I have seen have been anywhere from $200 to $500 per infraction. So this can get quite expensive. The Board of Social Work Examiners determines the number of contact hours of supervision needed as well as the amount of the fine. So those numbers that I've quoted you are just the averages or the most common numbers that I've seen. It doesn't mean that, that that's the exact parameters. Now another form of discipline and probably the most common is a reprimand and this is just like reprimands that occur on the job. These stipulations tend to be the same as those for the suspended license. For example, additional ethics hours or additional supervision. But the licensee is allowed to continue to practice while the stipulations are met. These tend to be for uh, lesser infractions. So there's usually a specified time frame in which to meet these stipulations. If they are not met, then further disciplinary action may be taken by the State Board of Social Work Examiners. And that disciplinary action can be a suspension. And then if the person fails to meet the requirements of the suspension, then the license may be revoked. So it does get progressively worse as the discipline increases. There's also what is frequently referred to as the wall of shame. All disciplinary proceedings are public record, and they can be found, including the disposition of the case, on the Board of Social Work Examiner's website under disciplinary actions. So these stay up for anyone to see. They can see what the allegations were. They can read what the dispositions were, and also a lot of employers will review this disciplinary section before they hire a social worker to see if the person has been disciplined before. And some of these disciplinary actions on the website go as far back as 1999. So now that we've talked a little bit about our code of ethics, I want to take a few minutes and talk about ethical dilemmas. Now, a code of ethics is a set of guidelines or core beliefs to which a profession upholds its members. It's the standards that we require our other social workers to follow and to meet. A violation of the code of ethics is not the same thing as an ethical dilemma. Those really are two separate issues. An ethical dilemma results when two or more of these standards conflict with each other. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those. So how do we go about making a decision when we're faced with an ethical dilemma? First of all, consult the code. And you'll hear me say that over and over and over. But always consult the code. It is a guideline. It is what we go by to determine appropriate behavior. It also will help us determine if there actually is an ethical dilemma. Uh, you also may need to consult the law. There may be certain laws that may be in conflict um, with the standards of the board. Um, one example of, of conflicts is that within health care, a 14-year-old can sign for their own services. That means they can come into the health department and sign for services and receive birth control without their parents' knowledge. However, according to the law, the legal age of consent for sexual relationships is the age of 16. So there's a two-year gap there. Sometimes that creates ethical dilemmas. Also, seek supervision or legal consultation. Everyone has a supervisor. 
everyone has someone that they have to report to who's that, who is there to give them guidance. You also may want to do a, a peer review of the case. Sometimes just talking it out with another person can help, make this, help you make decisions. Just be very mindful about confidentiality. And then D, if you determine that there is a true ethical dilemma, then we have to make the choice that will inflict the least harm. And those are very difficult choices. It's like coming to a fork in the road. You can either go right or you can go left. Neither is right and neither is wrong. They're just different, but you have to choose one. The same is true for ethical dilemmas. So in summary, some ethical violations are obvious and they're easily avoided. We know that stealing from our clients is wrong. We know that having sexual relationships with our clients is wrong. We know that we can't violate confidentiality. However, there are other situations that are not so obvious. Oftentimes, we are faced with ethical dilemmas during our careers. These are situations where we have to make a decision between two conflicting values or two conflicting aspects of the same code of ethics. Or we must decide which response will cause the least amount of harm. Think of it this way. Probably someone will not be happy with the outcome, but we still have to make a choice. How often do we find ourselves in a situation where what is in the best interest of the client isn't necessarily in the best interest of our employing agency? If you work in healthcare, you're very familiar with this. It's particularly physicians because insurance companies may say that a, a patient can only stay in the hospital for a specified length of time. And the physician may want them there a little longer. So there's always that kind of a conflict where the employing agency requires one thing and yet what you think is in the best interest of the client is another. Or we may have to make a decision that will benefit one family member or one party and actually harm the other. Those are very difficult. Our code of ethics serves as a tool or a guide to help us make these difficult decisions when there are competing interests. Now here's an example of an ethical dilemma. You and a colleague are both eligible for a promotion. You and your colleague are friends on Facebook and you've seen pictures and posts that lead you to believe she's romantically involved with one of her clients. What do you do? Does this create an ethical dilemma for you? Well, if we remove the part about you being friends on Facebook and about the, uh, the possible promotion, it makes it a lot easier. If you suspect that a, a colleague is having a romantic relationship with a client, it's very simple. That needs to be reported. It, it is a true ethical violation. But we sort of muddy the waters a little bit when we add the, the issue about the promotion or the fact that this is a friend on Facebook. So how do we, what steps do we take in determining what you should do? Well, you, you've heard me say it before and I'm going to say it again. You consult the code. Is this a true ethical dilemma or is it very clear what should be done in this situation? And if you review all of those components that we reviewed before, then you'll see that there is one component that says social workers shall not exploit professional relationships for personal gain. By making a report against your colleague, does that give you an unfair advantage in the promotion? Probably so. But then there's also the ethical standard that says that a social worker should take action through appropriate channels against unethical conduct by any other member of the profession. That's when things get very confusing because here you have two options that seem to be directly opposed to each other. And choosing each option is also correct. So what do you do? The steps to take in determining what you should do are, once you've 
once you have consulted the code and you have determined that this is a true ethical dilemma, then seek supervision or consultation. Now, in this particular situation, it can get very, very hairy because should you seek supervision from the person who's making the choice about the promotion? Probably not. Should you consult that the person who is one step higher than your direct supervisor, assuming that your direct supervisor is making the decision on the promotion? That may be a better option. Should you consult coworkers? Should you consult the legal department within your agency? These are all things that have to be considered and none of these are to be taken lightly. Lastly, you have to make the choice that will inflict the least harm. Or as some people will say, you have to make the choice that you can live with. Someone will be unhappy no matter what happens in this particular situation. Uh, you, you may lose your friend, but also there's a, a client who may be being injured by this relationship. So someone will not be happy with the outcome, but you have to make the choice that will inflict the least harm. Another example of an ethical dilemma. You have a pregnant client who is a 15-year-old sophomore in high school, and she discloses that the father of her baby is the 18-year-old valedictorian of the senior class, and he has just been awarded an academic scholarship to a prestigious university. Does this present an ethical dilemma? On the surface, it would seem that it doesn't. Uh, you have a 15-year-old that's clearly under the age of legal consent, and the alleged father of the baby, or in this case, what would be we would call the alleged perpetrator, is 18 years old. And in Alabama, if there is a two-year age gap, then this is reportable. We as social workers or anyone who is an employee of the Department of Public Health is a mandated reporter to DHR. So this is a situation that, according to the law, should be reported to DHR. So it sounds like this really isn't an ethical dilemma. It should be very clear. But let's look at it a little deeper. Again, the law requires you as a mandated reporter to file a report with DHR about the sexual abuse of a minor. But then you have to step back and consider what will happen if you file this report. One, the father of the baby could face criminal charges. Uh, he could go to prison. He would be labeled as a sex offender for the rest of his life. He would lose his scholarship, which would negatively impact his ability to provide financial and emotional support to your client and her baby in the future. So it's not as simple as, well, we just have to make that report. You have to look at what else could happen as a result of filing that report and how will you handle the consequences. So the two competing interests here are, one, your legal responsibility as a mandated reporter versus what's in the best interest of those involved. Are the parents involved supportive of the relationship? Um, he's a senior, she's a sophomore, they would be considered peers. It's the age gap that makes the difference. Okay, let's look at an ethical dilemma that is outside of the realm of health care. A social worker has been assigned to complete home studies on both the maternal and paternal grandparents of a minor child. Parental rights have been terminated and the home studies are being conducted to assist the juvenile judge in determining which grandparents will be allowed to adopt the child. However, the maternal grandmother makes a baby blanket and presents it as a gift to the obviously pregnant social worker during her home visit. So does this present an ethical dilemma for the social worker? Of course it does. According to the Code of Ethics, a social worker should not exploit professional relationships for personal gain. Now even though the social worker did not request the baby blanket, it could still be viewed as exploiting the situation for personal gain, which in this case would be the baby blanket. That part of the Code of Ethics 
is also in conflict with the importance of human relationships. We don't want to offend the folks that we're working with. And in this case, if the social worker were to refuse the gift, then that could be uh, very offensive to the grandmother. So what are the concerns related to this particular dilemma? Again, as we just stated, if the social worker refuses the gift, will the working relationship be damaged? Um, oftentimes, the social workers are required to make follow-up visits. So if this social worker in this situation refused this gift and then was required to do some follow-up visits with the family, um, assuming that the child was placed with the maternal grandparents, then would that damage that working relationship? Or, on the other hand, if the worker accepts the gift and the judge chooses the maternal grandparents, will it appear as though the gift was a bribe? So we really, really have to use our critical thinking skills in situations like this and go through the perceptions that may be made based on the decisions we make. Um, I can also tell you that ADPH, along with most every state agency that I'm aware of, has very strict policies on accepting gifts. So that's another issue that has to be taken into account here. Social media. Uh, we touched on it briefly earlier, and I'm going to bring it back up again here. Social media presents many ethical dilemmas for all professionals. It's not just social workers who can get in some hot water when it comes to social media. So here's an example of an ethical dilemma that's related to social media. A social worker accepts a friend request from a minor client. One day while the social worker is scanning through the news feed, she happens to see pictures or posts about the minor's use of drugs and or alcohol. Does this present an ethical dilemma? Yes, it does. The, the two issues here are the client's right to self-determination as well as confidentiality versus the client being involved in dangerous and illegal acts. So should the social worker break confidentiality and inform the parents and or law enforcement? Some other issues to be considered are what liabilities would the agency involved have if the social worker did breach confidentiality? What are the liabilities if she doesn't? In this situation, obviously this social worker needs to consult with her supervisors, but also with her legal department. Changing it just a little bit, what if the social worker was not a friend of the minor child on social media, but just happened to see the pictures or posts on someone else's social media page? Would that make a difference in the social worker's decision of what to do? Again, ethical dilemmas really don't have a right or wrong answer. We have to choose what will do the least damage. So let's look at a situation that can occur inside the home. Um, a home health social worker is working with a diabetic patient. The patient has Medicaid, but her partner, who is also a diabetic, does not. Both of them are insulin dependent. And if you're familiar with insulin in recent years, you know that the price has gone up drastically. So the partner is no longer employed full time because of the need to care for the patient and keep her at home instead of in an institution. The partner no longer has employment related health insurance and must depend on purchasing a policy through the marketplace. The copays make purchasing insulin much more expensive and with the household income reduced, Remember, the partner has gone from working full-time to working part-time. The ability to purchase the needed vials of insulin has been greatly compromised. So the patient, who has obviously a very close relationship with the social worker, tells her social worker that the only reason she is able to remain at home is because of the excellent care she is receiving from her partner. The patient further confides 
that she only needs about half the insulin that she claims to be using in order to share the extra insulin with her partner. So the dilemma here is the client's right to confidentiality, which of course she released this information to the social worker in confidence, versus the fact that the social worker shall not condone fraud or deceit. Clearly this is Medicaid fraud because Medicaid is paying for medication for an individual who is not covered by Medicaid. So in this situation, the social worker also knows that her role is to improve the outcome for the patient, which in this situation means to allow the patient to remain in her own home, as well as reduce the cost of care to Medicaid. So in this case, really, the social worker is working for two different entities, the patient as well as Medicaid. The social worker knows that the cost of institutionalization far exceeds the cost of the extra vial of insulin that Medicaid is paying for each month. So what should the social worker do? As stated before, consult her supervisor, consult the legal department, Obviously, it's an ethical dilemma, so she's already consulted the code of ethics. But it's very, very difficult in these situations to know what to do because someone is going to be uh, unhappy no matter what happens. Now, not all situations like this are necessarily ethical dilemmas. Sometimes the, the ethics that we aspire to are in direct conflict with our own personal values and beliefs or our own morals. For example, medical advancements have created these dilemmas that we would never have encountered a few decades ago or even a few years ago. Like the technology that now allows very tiny infants to survive when just a few years ago they would not have been considered viable even though the consequences of their survival may be severe and painful lifelong disabilities. For some people, that becomes a very moral um, dilemma. Perhaps we have a client who has been diagnosed with cancer who chooses to forego treatment even though there is a high probability of her being cancer-free after the treatment. As a social worker, we believe in the client's right to self-determination. So again, we have to check our own personal values, our own personal beliefs at the door. Um, the, the client has the right to choose what she wants to do with her life, even if we disagree with it. Perhaps, particularly when you're working in uh, the family planning clinic, we may be faced with serving a client who has chosen to terminate her unplanned pregnancy, which may be in direct conflict with our own personal values and beliefs. But remember that we must give precedence to our professional responsibilities over our own personal beliefs, because clients have a right to self-determination. You may also be asked to serve a client who is requesting emergency contraception even though that goes against your religious beliefs. Now this is one that we as an agency have faced for several years now and the department has always worked diligently to assist employees who find themselves in this particular situation. Some employees have requested transfers into other positions to avoid being put in this circumstance and the department has been able to grant those transfers. Other employees, unfortunately, have chosen to leave the agency because there, there were no other positions for them to go into. And that's completely understandable. So again, what do we do when we're faced with an ethical dilemma? One, you consult the code. And here we've, we've reviewed the code and it seems pretty clear we also consult the law. The law actually is very clear as well, but these two seem to conflict with each other. While one, you have the responsibility of reporting it, but on the other hand, are you creating a situation where 
the child and your client may lose some financial and emotional support for their future. It's a very difficult decision. So C, seek supervision or legal consultation. This is a situation that you definitely want to discuss with your supervisor. And you also want to bring in a legal consultation. And D, you have to make the choice that will inflict the least harm. Again, I'm not telling you which choice to make. That is a choice that you have to make as a social worker. But again, when you have a true ethical dilemma, there is no easy answer. There is no easy choice to be made. So to wrap this up, our code of ethics is there to serve as a tool or as a guide. I know it's lengthy. 27 pages is a lot of information to go over. However, it's there for a reason. And as we have advanced, as technology has advanced, then we have been put in a position where we really have no choice but to study our code of ethics because it's very easy to slip up and make a mistake without meaning to, particularly around issues with social media. If you think about Facebook, if you put on there where you work, then you have to be very careful about things that you post about that happened at work because people can link that. You have to be very careful about taking pictures within the office because you never know who could be in the background of those pictures. Um, another decision that you have to make is, is it a good idea to accept a friend request from a client? What about from your supervisor or coworkers? These are all decisions that you have to weigh out and decide what's best for you. Secondly, it does not, nor will the code, ever replace professional judgment. Professional judgment comes with one, with experience, and that's again why discussing things with your supervisor can help, or with coworkers who have more experience than you, or perhaps they've been through similar situations that you're facing now. However, the code can't address everything. It can't address specifics. It can give us just general recommendations. So professional judgment will always be necessary. True ethical dilemmas are very difficult to resolve. Again, like I've said, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. There are two answers. And we have to choose what's right between the two. What is right for that situation or what is best for that situation is a better way to word it. Um, again, neither right, neither wrong, but most likely someone will not be happy with the choice that's made. But we have to make the choice that one that we can live with and that will inflict the least harm. Seek supervision. Always seek supervision. Ethical dilemmas or ethical decisions even are burdens that you don't need to carry alone. That's why supervisors are there. Seek their, their guidance and then let them share in the responsibility of the decision. Seek legal consultation. Most agencies or probably all agencies have a legal team. Consult with them on these issues to help you make the right decision for you and for the situation. Always seek peer reviews and support from others who are in similar situations or who have faced similar situations and those who have a lot more experience than perhaps you have. Although there have been a few revisions, the primary components of the Social Work Code of Ethics, both the NASW and the ABSWE Code of Ethics, are very, very similar, and they have been providing practice guidance and protecting the public for over 50 years. They're there, they're on the website, NASW has a website, as well as the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners. Again, it's socialwork.alabama.gov. These, these articles are on there. I urge you to print them off and read, read them and stay up to date on when they are revised. Again, there hasn't been a revision um, in the last 
16 or 17 years. So there may be revisions coming up. I don't know. It depends on, a lot of it depends on technology. Um, years ago, we never would have dreamed of providing therapy through telehealth. That's something that's fairly new. So that's, again, we may see some, some clarification emerging around those issues. Um, we have Skyping now that we can communicate with our clients with. So again, services are provided in a different way now than they were 50 years ago. Um, and 50 years from now, who knows how those services will be provided. But do consult the code. And I thank you for joining us today. And I hope you will join us for our future programs on ethics um, through the Alabama Public Health Training Network.